Awesome. How is your guys' week three going? Good. It's raining. Thanks for showing up. Um, this week, we're, it's water and plastic pollution week. We have Lisa Cost Boyle. Um, she's an environmental lawyer, and she um, co-founded the, um, the Plastic Pollution Coalition, and she's also a board um, member of um, Heal the Bay, which is wonderful. So wonderful. And really briefly, we have Kathy from the, um, the Center for Community Learning here, and she will be um, giving you some information about how to get more involved um, at UCLA in terms of sustainability and just a lot of really cool things. So she's going to talk really briefly and have some handouts. And then we'll watch a quick video and then have Lisa talk and then get out a little bit early and do those mini office hours. So it should be a really fun day and you guys can get all home safely in the rain. So here will be Kathy. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today. I wanted to let you know that the Center for Community Learning exists and then I wanted to tell you about some of the opportunities that you may be interested in through our center. So you should get, when all is said and done, four things that are being passed out right now. The first is our center brochure to tell you what's under our roof. And there's a lot of different categories of things. For example, if you wanted to get academic credit for an internship, we're the place you come and we set that up for you in one of five different academic departments. Those are available for two units or four units for a grade, pass, no pass. So if you're really involved with something in the community and you're really involved in a project, you might consider getting academic credit for your work. Second, we're the place where faculty come when they want to set up service learning courses. So every single quarter, we work with a whole host of faculty who want to teach a course that includes an off-campus something that's connected to the curriculum or who want to convert an existing course into a service learning course. So we work with faculty on those things all the time. We also have three AmeriCorps programs, and these are service scholarships for students who have extended community service projects going on. So one of them, um, and I believe that's the yellow sheet that's coming around, is called Students in Service. So if you're doing a lot of uh, community work, a lot of service, if you're part of clubs and organizations, you can get a $1,000 scholarship for the work that you're probably going to do anyway. So if you're interested in applying for that program, please come see us. Um, the coordinators uh, for that program are Christopher Newman and Recon Vu, and their email address and name should be on the yellow flyer. But if you have a project going on and you want to get academic credit or scholarship money for your work, come see us. We're also home to the Civic Engagement Minor, the only minor of its kind in the country that can be paired with any major. So again, if you want to make a more serious academic commitment to the work that you do, you can enroll in the civic engagement minor and design your project around your passion. So for example, there's a required internship and a capstone research project related to a policy issue. You could make any topic your choice of internship and placement site and then design your capstone research project around that same area. So it's all designed around your interests. So consider the civic engagement minor if you know you're going to be doing extended work in the community, internships, research, whatever it might be. Um, the other handout that I'm passing out, the fourth thing that you should get when all is said and done, is about our new Aston Civic Engagement Scholarship Program. So if any of you are current juniors, we've got juniors in the crowd? Okay. So in the spring, current juniors will be invited to apply for a scholarship to, that you would get in your senior year for a project that you would propose that involves a community partner and a faculty sponsor. The project is designed to take your entire senior year and Aston Civic Engagement Scholars receive $2,000 each quarter for that project. Now, you don't have to design a project that costs $2,000 a quarter. That scholarship goes to you to carry out that project during your senior year. The idea being we want to encourage people to get involved with community-based organizations and policy issues that they, they care deeply about, but maybe that $2,000 a quarter would keep you from having to take another part-time job to keep yourself alive, and you get to do the important work that you really care about. So you see how all these things fit together. We're encouraging students for either the incentive of academic credit or scholarship money to propose projects that they want to do and carry out and see how we can support that work. Now, if you have an, uh, an idea for a project like, say, the Aston Civic Engagement Scholars Program, but you don't really have a firm picture of what you would propose, come see me. 
I'm happy to meet with any students to talk about any of these things, but if you've got kind of a big idea or a germ of an idea and you want to talk about how you could craft that into something that's successful for, say, one of these scholarship programs, I'm happy to sit down and talk to you. So um, I'll put my email address on the board when I'm finished, but please check out some of these exciting options, the scholarship programs, internships for academic credit, um, all the different ways that you can connect your work um, with your undergraduate education. Are there any questions about any of this? Questions? How many of you have heard of the Center for Community Learning before? A few. Good. Um, no questions? All right. Let me put my email address on the board, and please do contact me if you want to get together for a meeting on, for more information on any of these. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Okay, so it's a rainy day, and we are going to watch a really brief video before Lisa speaks to you. So enjoy. Well, now that you're, can you hear me? Is this working? Yes. Now that you're thoroughly depressed, I hope to, uh, to talk about some potential solutions so that we don't leave you feeling like there's nothing to be done. Um, I want to introduce myself a little bit. My name is Lisa Boyle, and I'm an environmental attorney. Uh, I started uh, my environmental education in undergraduate, like you all, and then when I went to uh, law school at Tulane University, I studied environmental law and became involved with an environmental law clinic, which was a way to, to actually get practical experience while I was still a student. And we had actual clients, which was wonderful. One of my clients was Greenpeace, and that was my first introduction to the issue of plastics. Now, Louisiana, as some of you may know, some of you may be from Louisiana, is pretty much uh, the central production zone for petrochemicals, chemicals made from petroleum. And a big swath of, of the river there is known as the chemical corridor, or the cancer corridor, because of all this petrochemical pollution that goes into the water, goes into to the groundwater and poisons the people there. Um, so when I was in law school, my client was Greenpeace, and Greenpeace was upset because in the one of the state buildings, in the Natural Resources Building, there was a display put on by by the chemist, the chemical industry, and here on state ground they had this big exhibit touting the wonders of plastic, you know, how, as Charles Moore was saying, you know, the throwaway society, how wonderful it is that it frees us all up. And, you know, they had disposable diapers and plastic silverware and everything, you know, saying how great this was. Well, Greenpeace didn't think that was so great. And uh, so they came to our law clinic looking to see if they could get equal space to the public forum to put up their display, educating the public about why plastic isn't such a great thing, all the way from its birth, from, from being manufactured from oil, through its use and its disposal, and the remnants being in our environment. So uh, we, we won that, and it was really exciting. It was, it was great for me, and long after I left law school, our anti-plastics display was still up in the Natural Resources Building, and we felt really good about that because the pro-plastic industry had been up there for so long. But that wasn't my first time battling the uh, chemical, that was my first time battling the chemical industry, but it hasn't been my last, and, uh, and I'll get more into that. But um, after I graduated from law school, I came to California and I went to work in the district attorney's office in the environmental uh, prosecution section. And that was just a fantastic opportunity. And when, when I graduated, it was, it was a slow time uh, in hiring, like you may be facing when you graduate, unfortunately, again. And uh, the district attorney's office wasn't really hiring, but I just knew I wanted to 
prosecute environmental criminals. So I went with my law degree and I said, I'll work here as long as it takes. And so I just volunteered until they were hiring and then basically they had to take me because I'd been working for free. So that's how I got into environmental prosecution and that was just a great opportunity and I stayed in the district attorney's office for seven years and really, really enjoyed it. But then I wanted to focus my attention on the ocean and on uh, water pollution. So one of my good friends, Mark Gold, who is the executive director of Heal the Bay, asked me to come be the director of law and policy at Heal the Bay. So I went there and that's when I started to get really into all the different things that could be done to attack this plastic problem. And we kind of thought about it in three different ways at Heal the Bay. Um, there, there was legislation that we're still working on. I still serve on the executive board there. Um, and we worked at it from the idea of trying to stop the plastic from reaching the ocean. And that was through something called trash TMDLs, total, total maximum daily loads. I can see that you may be a little familiar with that. But the idea was we set the, the allowable limit of plastics allowed to get into the rivers and into the ocean at zero. So that puts the burden on the municipalities to say, to do something. You know, we can't let, let trash get into the ocean. And that makes them have to come up with creative solutions like catch basins, and you're going to see some more footage in a DVD I'm going to show you about some of these creative solutions to hold the trash back. Um, also, we looked at the building component of plastics, which are called nurdles. Has anybody heard that word before? A weird word. Basically, it's like plastic polenta. <laughs> you know, it looks like little tiny round balls. And we had a lot of fun going to the Capitol when we got legislation regarding nurdles passed, going around Sacramento with little vials of this stuff. We got stopped at the airport because people really wondered what these little vials with little plastic balls in them were. But um, the legislators got it that you know when they when they could hold this stuff and understand that these little balls are the um, the building blocks of everything that's made of plastic. And they're melted so that they can be formed into any shape. So uh, the problem with nurdles is that they're so small that a catch basin, for instance, can't catch them. And uh, so they're below five millimeters. So we needed to find out how these nurdles could be stopped from getting into the rivers and then, then, and then into the ocean. They are a huge component of plastic pollution in the ocean at the beaches. And in fact, in some beaches, the, the plastic polenta ratio to sand ratio is, is pretty uh, jarring. And it's hard to tell you know, that this, this isn't a part of the natural environment. And it looks like fish eggs. So a lot of creatures will ingest it because it looks so delicious to them. But you know, it has no nutritive value in it starves them. So um, the way these, these pellets were getting out into the environment were through bad business practices of the companies manufacturing them, transporting them, and the companies using them. And they just easily blow and spill, and you'll see examples of that in the film. And what's, what's really bad about these, as uh, Charles Moore was saying, that all plastics uh, they're oleophilic, they draw oil to them like sponges. So when these things get out into the ocean, they'll attract anything oily. And living in a big city like we do in Los Angeles with all the cars, all the oil washing to the sea, they, they will absorb all the grease from, from the land, from, from urban runoff. Plus, we have a pretty sad history here, as you may know, there's a lot of DDT and PCBs in the water, and these plastic bits will attract those as well. So that, that the plastic that's in the ocean, not only is it toxic in itself to these creatures, 
but it magnifies the surrounding water's toxicity by absorbing all these uh, oils with their additional toxins. So we at Heal the Bay with some other groups got legislation passed. This is one of our successes, battling the chemical industry on um, getting plastics legislation passed is extremely difficult. The reason that we got the, the Nurdles legislation passed is because we actually had cooperation from the plastics people because some plastics industries were actually using what's called best management practices and they were doing a pretty good job of containing the Nurdles. So it was pretty hard for the, the bad players to say it couldn't be done. So we used the companies that were doing it the right way to show how it should be done and to convince the legislature that this wasn't impossible and that, that was a big success. So then the other thing that we considered beyond how to stop things from getting into the water, um, how to deal with containment of the nurdles, was also the chemicals that are actually in plastic. And plastic being uh, made from oil, you know, contains a lot of bad things. And it has, uh, it has uh, a lot of carcinogen, endocrine disruptors, neurotoxins, all these bad things that are, are part of its uh, makeup. So at Heal the Bay, we worked on um, legislation to stop phthalates, which are in plastics. They're there to make, um, it's a plasticizer that makes things malleable. And so a lot of, unfortunately, baby toys would have this in it, like rubber duckies and, and chewy, you know, teething rings because it makes it nice and squishy. But it's, it's a very potent endocrine disruptor, as is BPA, bisphenol alanine. And we've been successful. There's actually federal legislation on phthalates now. But BPA, I, I just cannot even believe this. This was a failure in this last uh, legislative cycle. We were a few votes sh short of getting BPA only out of baby feeding products. And that shows you how powerful the, um, the BPA lobby was. Um, there are 6 million pounds of BPA produced every year, and it's a six billion dollar industry. So even though it's not necessary to be in your plastics, and there are many plastics without it, the industry doesn't want to see it disappear, and they do a pretty good job of lobbying on its behalf. And we had science on our side, um, and of course the plastic industry put out their own studies saying that BPA is not harmful, but uh, for instance, the National Institute of Health and, and uh, many very, very esteemed bodies considers this to be a great danger. And what's really shocking is that if any of you were to go take a blood test right now, most of you, 93% of you, would have BPA in your blood in, and in your tissues. We all absorb these things. And for babies, it's a really, really bad thing because as an endocrine disruptor, your endocrine system are the switches that tell your body when to develop. So if those switches go off at the wrong time, you know, it's, it's really dangerous for, uh, for development. And uh, there's, a, there's a lot of information saying that this can lead to cancer and a lot of other really horrible things. So we were just trying to get it out of um, baby bottles and out of the lining of infant formula. Um, you may not know this, but every single can, including your 7-Up can and your baked beans and everything, has a lining inside the metal that has BPA in it. So we're, we've all ingested it. We were just trying to get it out of the baby stuff. <laughs> so what we did when we saw that we were a few votes short is we um, took it off. So it, we, we didn't allow it to make bad precedent. We'll put it up again next legislative session. And we're hoping that, that in the meantime we can educate more people 
uh, and, and gets more power behind it. But, uh, you know, this legislative session, for many reasons, including the, the horrible budget, it was just really hard to get anyone's attention on anything except for the uh, economic crisis. So we're still hoping for that. So um, I, I'd like to tell you a little bit more of how uh, Charles Moore and I came together. I, I, as you can see from the video, he's a really dynamic and incredible man. And I was, you know, doing my legislative thing at Heal the Bay and heard him talk and heard about his journeys out to the North Pacific Gyre. And I thought, oh my God, you know, I just can't believe that there's this huge amount of plastic a thousand miles off our shore where there are no people. And, you know, and I didn't even know about it. And I'd been working on, on plastic pollution, you know. And so I met with him and with his other uh, scientists. Marcus Erickson and Anna Cummins, and really got to know what they were doing and started taking them on a little, little road show, kind of like what Al Gore was doing with, with his slideshow about global warming, except we talked about plastic pollution. And, uh, and they were much, although I love Al Gore and I'm a Tennessean, so I particularly love him, uh, they were a little bit more dynamic than, than Al Gore's presentation and continue to be so. But, um, but what's so interesting about Charles Moore and uh, is his background, you know, he is an heir to an oil fortune uh, from Hancock Oil. And he never had to, to work. He was a yacht, yachting enthusiast and he was actually in Hawaii having just won a, a yachting race, and he decided to take an unusual way back to Los Angeles. He lives in Long Beach, um, and decided to go through the gyre, and nobody ever goes through there because it's, it's, there's no wind, but it's truly the shortest route. He was like, oh, what the heck, you know, I'm going to try this. So he went through. And he just got so depressed because it was day after day after day of just plastic. And he couldn't believe it. And he made the connection in his mind, you know, this is part of the production of oil. Actually, uh, uh, I think it's about an eighth of, a, of every barrel of oil goes to the production of plastics. So. So he thought, you know, I have some responsibility here. I'm going to use my fortune and I'm going to start this organization, which he named after his boat, the Algalita Foundation. And he's been doing research ever since. He, he goes out with his team of scientists and they measure the gyre pollutions and they do that plastic to plankton ratio that he was telling you about, which is really sad when you think that something artificial is in six times greater number than the plankton, which is the, the basic beginning of our food chain. So, so he was alarmed, and he continues to do incredible research and writes peer-reviewed articles about it. And then he hired this great, great guy, uh, Marcus Erickson, who does research for him too. And Marcus was a Marine. Uh, before he was a scientist, and uh, he was in the Gulf War, and he was actually there at the same time that my brother was, and both of them became anti-war activists after coming out of Iraq, and Marcus decided to take it in an environmental way and said, you know, I was over there coated in oil, looking at all the oil burning, and it just made me so mad that I was over fighting for oil. And when I got back, he's, he's also a, a great uh, outdoors person. He said all I could see was plastic, and it just made him so mad. He got into uh, working with Charles Moore at Al Galita. So, uh, so he's been out to the gyre many times, and he's about to take a journey into the Atlantic gyre. There are actually five gyres. There's a gyre in every ocean. And, you know, the only one that's been studied at all is the one off our coast. 
And, and you know, that's just because Charles Moore found it. <laughs> but there are every ocean with these natural currents will collect whatever debris is out there. And the majority of our debris is plastic. 80% of the debris in the ocean is plastic. So that's what accumulates. So um, anyway, after, uh, after getting to know these guys, I decided that, that we had to take it on another, to another level because these guys were out there doing great, great science and coming up with these amazing and alarming statistics. But what can be done? As Charles Moore ended his TED talk, you know, he just ends it. <laughs> and you're just like, ah, what am I going to do? And, and one time I was in a talk with him, and somebody said, so what should we do? And he said, oh, that's a question for the philosophers. And so I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> you know, you can't leave them like that, because there are things that we can do. And uh, he's a pure scientist, uh, but we need to take it a, another level into changing the way we behave and the way industry behaves so that we don't have this problem. As Charles Moore said, there's no way to clean up what's already out in the ocean. There's actually a, a group that is getting funding from the plastic industry uh, called Project Kansai that is going out there and they're, they're documenting, but they're also talking about how they're going to get all this plastic and they're going to use it to make diesel fuel from the ocean. And literally, the amount of space that is covered just in this one gyre off our coast, uh, the original estimates were twice the size of Texas. That's what Charles Moore said when, when he first was out there. But he said that was just a misunderstanding of, because that's the amount that he measured. But there are truly plastics in the entire gyre area, which covers an area twice the size of our country. So that, and that's one gyre. And this stuff isn't just on the surface, like you could see. It goes all the way down. There are reports from submersibles that have seen like ghost armies of upside down plastic bags floating along where, you know, there are fish that, that have light systems, you know, neon lights, and then these crazy, eerie plastic bags. So there's really no way that you could get the plastics out without disturbing the entire ecosystem that they're meshed with. So the question becomes, what, what can we do to stem this tide? And does anybody have any ideas in this class? Any? Well, first, let's be more decomposable, um, like type material sort of thing. That's, that's a great idea. That's what they have at our outdoor cafe. At where? At our um, Jersey Cafe. Um, right. And that's probably made from corn. It's called PLA. Anybody else? <laughs> like, <laughs> like my Heal the Bay bag. <laughs> yeah. This counts for bringing down containers or water bottles and food. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Anybody else? Okay, well, what, what we uh, were thinking is uh, that, that, we needed to approach through all those ways that you're talking about and through all different kinds of media to get the message out. And part of the, let me backtrack a minute, part of the, the thing that we want to communicate is that plastics are, are damaging through their entire life cycle. From the beginning, from the extraction of the oil, uh, you know, as Marcus was saying, why should we be going to foreign countries trying to get oil uh, to make plastic? It's just, it's just silly. Um, and the fact is that, that we're making primarily single-use items out of this stuff, and it lasts virtually forever. 
So it's this, the most ridiculous thing to make something that's going to last forever that you're going to use maybe for a, you know, a few seconds. It's really wasteful. So um, also, uh, as I was saying, when you use it, it poisons you. There's leaching from your plastic water bottle and from the insides of cans of those petrochemicals into your food products. There are sci scientific studies showing that. And especially if you leave your plastic water bottle in the sun, that exacerbates it. And you don't know where that plastic bottle has been before you got it. I mean, sometimes I just like look around outside stores where they have big piles of plastic water bottles outside waiting to be stocked and you think, you know, who knows how long that's been out in the sun. So it's communicating the dangers from, from use of the plastics and then the problem of disposal because uh, recycling, only about 3.5 to 5% of all plastics gets recycled. And that's a pretty sad thing when you're thinking about all the plastic packaging and single-use plastics we have. And in some areas it's higher, but the problem is that it doesn't stop the need for new plastic. What happens is if, if they, they make, if the plastic comes to a recycling center, it's made into, back into a raw material, and then it, unlike glass that can be made into another glass, the plastic gets down, down cycled into fluff for a down jacket or, you know, made into a park bench or road, but you're not going to keep it in, in the same chain. So more, more and more plastic bottles are being made. So that's why the chemical associations really are pushing recycling, because it in no way interferes with their profits. And um, so uh, the solutions that you were talking about are all really, really part of it. The bioplastics that you mentioned, um, I think this is really exciting, but it's, it's again, it's kind of keeping with the same mentality that we're just going to invest a lot in things that are disposable when, you know, it, the best thing is to invest in reusable things. So we're trying to spread the message of reusable bags and bottles and reduce packaging instead of encouraging just a switch into some other type of packaging. There are also some problems with the bioplastics. Um, the majority of them are made from corn. And I don't know if any of you saw the documentary King Corn. It's all about the, um, the problems with corn. Corn is generally uh, produced in mass agricultural. Archer Daniels Midland is the biggest corn manufacturer, I'm going to call them, because they're genetically engineered. They have tons of pesticides. They're this huge monoculture crop. So um, Archer Daniels Midland is in the business of making bioplastics, a company called NatureWorks, because they're in the business of corn. So that's why it's being made from corn. I think that there could be other things to make bioplastics from that would be more sustainable than, than using this corn that, you know, there's a huge dead zone at the bottom of the Mississippi from corn production, from all the nitrogen from the fertilizer uh, and pesticides. So, so corn's just not the greatest. And the same arguments come up with the arguments about ethanol from corn. Um, so, but, but I don't think bioplastics should be totally ruled out because we're going to always need some kind of packaging and at least it's not poisoning you when you use it. So, and another thing, they say that they're um, compostable, but it's not really true. I mean, it's true if you have access to an industrial uh, composting facility that can get up to 140 degrees and, you know, there are only 113 industrial compost facilities in the whole country. So uh, 
the system isn't set up yet to deal with bioplastics. And in fact, I called uh, the waste management here and said, you know, which bin do I put my nice little bioplastics that I got from, from Real Food Daily in? You know, where do I put my little corn fork? And they're like, uh, we don't know. And they put me through like 10 different people. And it turns out that can't put it in the green because our green is for lawn things. And they're not going to put it in an industrial compost facility. So you can't put it in there. You can't put it in the blue because they don't recycle it. So basically, you put it in the trash. So it just goes to the landfill like the other plastics where they tell me, even at NatureWorks, that it will last at least 100 years. But it is progress because it's not made from poisonous substances. And uh, so we're moving. But the infrastructure is not there at all to deal with it. So um, another thing that, that you mentioned is the bags and bottles. And that's what we're trying to, uh, to really push is uh, the idea that we all learned about the three R's, the reuse, reuse, uh, <laughs> Reuse, uh, recycle, reduce, reuse, recycle, yeah. I'm so brainwashed by the uh, ACC now that uh, I start to say it wrong. But um, reuse, reduce, and then recycle. Recycle is supposed to be the last thing. That's your last option. Because what you want to do is, is eliminate making trash like in No Impact Man, just, you know, if you use that over and over, you're not making trash. So that's your number one choice. And then it's reduce. You want to reduce, yeah? Reduce Oh. Is it? Yeah. OK. OK, you're right. <laughs> OK, well, I added a totally different one on top because I'm way more radical than this, which I'll tell you about. But uh, so, so you don't want to have trash, right? You don't want to put it in the trash can. You don't want to have to recycle it. You want to minimize your waste, right? And then recycling, which costs money, costs energy. Sometimes it's made into this uh, downgraded stuff, and we send it to China. You know, it's. A lot of times, there's not even a market for it. And the virgin material, that, those nurdles, can be cheaper than the recycled stuff. So it's just it's, recycling is not the answer to solving the plastics problem. But what we want to say is that the first R of the four R's should be refuse. Just right from the beginning, refuse single-use plastics because they're, they're just, uh, they're, they make no sense to have something that lasts forever and is used one time. So uh, that's what we're working on legislatively, you know, trying to get bag and bottle bans. And there are a number of countries and smaller, uh, and smaller municipalities that have been successful. And whether it's in putting a tax on them, like in Ireland, there's a 75 cents bag fee, which has reduced the use of plastic bags by 90%. Or just saying all, all out ban, San Jose this past week put a ban on paper and plastic. And so that's, that's pretty exciting. So, um, so that, that rethinking the three R's to make it actually four R's and to start at the top with refusing. And it's kind of hard sometimes because you get to the store and they're pushing plastic on you. And you have to like get there before them and say, I have my bag. Um, and then the next thing that we're working on is consumer, is that's consumer responsibility, manufacturing responsibility. And you know, we've got the whole system backward here where uh, the burden is put on us consumers to deal with all this crap that I mean, did anyone see on Curb Your Enthusiasm where he got a knife and it was in that horrible plastic that you can't get into 
So he had to get another knife to get into it, and then he couldn't even get into it. I mean, it's just so frustrating. So in Europe, they have a program called Green Dot, where the manufacturer is responsible for taking back the packaging. So think what that does to the equation. The manufacturer isn't going to want to put a lot of excess plastic there because they're going to have to deal with it. So plastic shrinks a lot. Here in America, we have a lot of problems of excess packaging to make products look really big and important and take up more shelf space. But then when you get to the real package, you know, get inside, and it's like this tiny thing. So, but if the, if the manufacturer is responsible for dealing with the trash instead of you, that, that problem tends to go away. So, um, so with all these things in mind, some friends of mine and I started the Plastic Pollution Coalition, which our goal is to be the trade association for all the wonderful people who are working on trying to, to uh, stop plastic pollution worldwide. And um, we are trying to be the, the, uh, the alternate to the, uh, the American Chemical Association, who puts so many billions of dollars into pushing plastics. And you know, there hasn't been a trade association for those people who want to push back. So we're trying to, to uh, strategize to, to have coherent communication, strategic planning, and a unified voice so that we can do advertising together like the milk people do, drink milk, you know. <laughs> so we're, uh, we're working together and we're going to have our launch uh, this month. I got uh, the DiCaprio Foundation to come on board with us for the launch, and that's really exciting. And the DiCaprio Foundation is also helping to sponsor the film series that we're going to have about plastic pollution here on campus, and that's uh, on the 23rd. And I'll make sure that all of you get an invitation to that. It's free of charge. And we'll be showing the movie Tapped, which is all about bottled water, which is really interesting. And then part of Strange Days, Planet Earth, which is an Edward Norton narrated show about plastic that one of my co-founders produced. And then we're going to show you a little bit from Midway Atoll, where another one of our co-founders just returned from going out to visit those albatross and, you know, filming them, their carcasses filled with the plastic and filming the adults feeding the chicks the plastic. So, uh, and then we're just going to show one more clip from a new movie called Bag It that's still being made. So I hope you will all be able to come to that. And in addition, uh, with our Plastic Pollution Coalition, we are really, really trying to, to get people to help us. We're going to break into committees to take on various tasks. For instance, we plan to have an international plastic pollution uh, meeting here at UCLA in about a year's time with all the great scientists that uh, specialize in this all around the world. And so we'll have a committee to help develop that. We're going to be using the media, social media, TV, all different, different uh, avenues to get the message out. So we're going to have a committee on that. And uh, we've already attracted some really, really cool people who've agreed to make PSAs for us, so that'll be fun. And we're trying to use the arts. There are so many cool ways to use the arts to communicate with the public. Um, Chris Jordan, one of his pieces was shown in that little bit. He is an amazing guy. He's a statistical artist. And he takes a fact like how many bottles we use in 10 minutes, and he photographs the bottles, he, well, he manipulates it um, artistically in an image where you can see all the bottles and then it's very abstract and then you zoom in until you see what it is. And he does that with so many different plastic statistics. Um, in fact, I got him to donate his plastic bag series to Heal the Bay at, uh, for a fundraiser. And so I have a plastic bag, <laughs> Chris Jordan, really, really cool because it looks it, it's this important statistic, but it looks like this totally abstract thing until you get close up. Well, uh, Chris Jordan 
uh, is an example of an artist who's communicating on plastics really well, and we want to put on a big uh, museum show all about plastics and, and use him and many different other artists to, to try and get this idea of especially the gyres out there because there's no way to aerially take a picture of this because it's too small, the bits. So it really is up to artists to think of ways to communicate this horrible problem. So my email is up here and our organization is up here. And if any of you uh, want to continue to be involved in this issue, I will find a home for you in our coalition to keep on working on this issue and will be greatly appreciative.